All right. Happy uh, Monday afternoon, I guess, or Monday evening, everybody. Uh, and welcome to the Iran Book Show, the new format for the Iran Book Show. Iran Book Show, Living Objectivism. That's uh, hopefully a title. Uh, hopefully a title uh, people would respond to. Broadcasting this live on uh, Facebook as well for those of you who want to see the video, and uh, those of you in Block Talk Radio. Uh, thanks for being here live with me. And uh, let me let me spend a little bit of time uh, talking about the new formats of the shows and uh, w what's going to happen in the next few weeks. Although uh, things are things are pretty much in flux, so uh, changing uh, everything's changing dramatically, and we'll be changing and still trying to work up all the uh, <clears throat> all the issues, timetables, and uh, what exactly we'll be doing when and how and uh, and with whom and everything else. So let's start with the fact that there are now uh, two Yuan book shows. One that is broadcast every week on the Blaze Radio Network Live, and then will be put up on uh, SoundCloud and on iTunes under the Yaron Brook um, show label. So there will be a new iTunes account under the Blaze Radio Network for Yaron Brook. Uh, those shows, the Blaze shows, will also be uploaded onto Block Talk Radio and therefore also feed into the old iTunes account, which has all these, all the old Block Talk Radio uh, shows. So you'll be able to get them everywhere. You'll be able to get them uh, in whatever format you've been getting them in the past. You'll be able to get them in a new format if you want to subscribe to the, uh, to the iTunes or the podcast uh, from, uh, from The Blaze. You'll be able to get them, uh, where else is there, on SoundCloud. You'll be able to get them everywhere. In addition... We're going to try uh, for most of the shows to put them up on Facebook Live. Uh, that uh, any any show I do from home will be put up on um, on Facebook Live. I'm also working on setting up a system where I can stream the show to Facebook Live and to YouTube Live and maybe to Periscope. We'll see. So uh, so the idea is that you will be able to watch them live on all those platforms and be able to chat on all those platforms in the comment section and everything, in addition to Block Talk and in addition to The Blaze. And um, generally, if you haven't subscribed yet to my YouTube channel, you should because there's all, all the old shows that were on Facebook Live are being put, are being put up onto, uh, onto YouTube. I'll be putting up a lot more content onto YouTube myself, not just through the Invade Institute channel and other channels, but I've created the Iran Book channel now that uh, a lot of the material will be going up through that channel. So subscribe there. So the basic goal right now, <laughs> and you know, you guys tell me if I'm crazy or insane or what. The basic goal right now is is to have a Yaron Brook something everywhere on uh, every social media platform. And I still have to break into Instagram and um, I don't know the other one, and and maybe that's that's the next phase later. But but let's get these. So YouTube, Facebook, Facebook Live, uh, Blog Talk, SoundCloud and podcasting and all the podcasting uh, stuff. So all of that, the idea is for the show uh, to be up everywhere. So that's, so, so the two shows now, as I was starting to say, and, and both of them will be everywhere, except that the Blaze show will, will be the one on the Blaze. And then uh, this show, the Living Objectivism, will not go up in the Blaze. That's the only difference. But everything else, everything will live in Blog Talk, everything will live in the podcasting. Uh, and, and so on. So it, it, it gets complicated, and I'll try to put everything up on YouTube. Uh, everything that we do videotape of will be up on YouTube, and everything we do videotape up of, of course, will be in Facebook Live, as it is right now. So no excuses. You've got gazillions of platform to consume the show, and uh, let's see how big we can grow it. So, so now the challenge is going to be, once we get this all in place, which I expect to take a few weeks, we've also got a website coming, the IranBookShow.com website we will also have um, uh, a Patreon site uh, to raise money specifically for the Iran Book Show. So that'll go up probably mid-July. So my guess is that by the end of July, we'll have all the pieces in place. Everything will be in place for the Iran Book Show, for YouTube, for, for all these things. We'll start thinking about what other things we could do in order to increase visibility and increased participation, maybe some kind of live Q&As like Dave Rubin does on, um, on YouTube and, uh, 
and other other similar things to, like that. So, and I'm open to ideas. So uh, you can write to me at ari radio at icloud.com, ari radio at icloud.com, with ideas on other ways in which to leverage all the social media platforms, and the kind of programming you would like to see, so that we can get maximum exposure and and really fulfill all the different things that I want to do with these shows. So. The Blaze Show's particular focus on The Blaze Show is to grow a maximum size audience. It's really to get to non-objectivists. It's to get to people who are either unfamiliar with Ayn Rand's work or new to Ayn Rand's work or maybe Red Atlas Shrugged and see if we can have an impact on that audience. And, of course, the challenge there is that The Blaze audience is an older audience and I would like a younger audience. And can we, can we shift that audience? Can we get... A, um, a younger audience to listen to my show on The Blaze or, or as a podcast. So that's, that's going to be part of kind of the challenge uh, going forward. And I have a feeling, let me, just, let me just make a change. I have a feeling that on, uh, that on, now let me lower the volume. Yeah, I think that's better. I think on, uh, on Facebook Live, the volume was too hot. So uh, I lowered the volume a little bit. Hopefully that helps. Uh, I haven't seen any comments on Facebook Live. Let's see if anybody's even watching on Facebook Live. Um, all right, we've got South Korea, we've got Michigan, we've got a few people listening on uh, watching uh, on Facebook Live. So there's a few there, but I think I think I just changed the volume and that's better. All right, so um, so we've got um, we've got the Blaze. Oops, still still seems hot every time I raise my voice. Okay, so we've got the Blaze and um, and that show. I'm excited about that show is to expand the market, to grow, to, to really get to non-objectivists. Uh, hopefully, uh, the Blaze will use their marketing muscle, 4 million people in their database, to uh, expose them to the idea of the show. Uh, and, and we'll see. We'll see where that takes us, how that grows. Um, the, 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 just for those of you skeptical about the Blaze, as I am a little bit as well, um, they have guaranteed no restrictions on what I say. Uh, so uh, I will be, uh, as usual, attacking religion, uh, uh, stating a pro-abortion stance, and you know, pro-immigration, the rest of the things that I usually uh, that I usually do. So um, anyway, all of that, all of that will be out there. Uh, that show, the Blaze Show, will be primarily dedicated to current events. Uh, w you know, with a, uh, of course, a philosophical spin. So uh, applying the objectivist philosophy. Uh, two current events. The second show, this show, the show you're listening to right now, is is going to be primarily dedicated to talking about uh, the objectivist philosophy, and the, uh, but primarily the application of the objectivist philosophy. Let's be very clear. I am not a philosopher. Uh, I'm not a technical philosopher. I'm, I'm, you know, truth is, I'm not that interested in technical philosophy. Uh, I'm interested in application, how to live it, how to apply it to your own life. And uh, I think that's a very, very rich area. There's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to discuss. Today we'll be talking about productivity, productiveness, the virtue of productiveness and what that means in terms of how to live your life and uh, the importance of it. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the virtues here. We'll talk about aesthetics here. We'll talk about some current events, but, but from a more philosophical perspective, uh, more principled perspective. So, um, but, but again, partially, the success of this show, even more so than the other show, is going to be dependent on you. It's going to be important for you to call in with questions relevant to the topic of the show, make this interesting, make this applicable to your lives. Uh, try to focus your questions on the topic at hand, whereas in the past we've gone all over the place with many of the topics here. We'll try to stay a little bit more focused. This is also be the, air, the, the place, I think, where I'll be discussing things related to the what we'll call the objectives community, to, to issues, ideas um, that are you know, the objectives community seems to be struggling with. So this is definitely going to be a show that's more an insider, more dedicated to people already dedicated to objectivism, already dedicated to Ayn Rand at various levels, beginners, advanced students, uh, who, who, you know, who want to have a forum, want to have a place uh, to be discussing, or at least want to have a forum, want to have a place to hear what I think about many of these issues um, and, and to give me some feedback on, uh, on this. Right now, this show is scheduled for Mondays at 4 p.m. Pacific time, but that that'll change, and 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 it might. This one's going to be somewhat flexible because this is a show 
that I plan to do from the road as I travel. So, for example, I can already tell you that next week I will not be doing it at uh, 4 p.m. on Monday because I'll be on a plane at 4 p.m. Pacific time on Monday. So I'll probably be doing it later in the week uh, for Puerto Rico. I'll be in Puerto Rico all next week, and next week I'll tell you why I'm going to Puerto Rico. Um, it, it will also be... So this will be a show that as I go to Europe, as I go to Asia, as I go to different places around the world, I'll be doing it from those places. And part of this show will be to tell you about how, 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 how goes the battle, uh, if you will, in the various parts of the world. Uh, people seem to be interested in that aspect of uh, the Iran book show as well. So this is clearly a show that is more insider, whereas the, uh, the Blaze show is a show that is targeted at and pitched at the outside world, and therefore will be primarily focused on teaching them about the objectivist ideas through the application to current events. We'll do some of that here, but, but a different emphasis, a different emphasis, and we'll try to go deeper philosophically here. I also hope to be able to uh, bring people on this show uh, from, uh, from the Institute, philosophers, and others to do some interviews. And I've told you before, I'm not a huge fan of interviews. Uh, I, I don't think I have a, a, a particularly comp competitive advantage at interviewing people. Uh, I get a little bored with it to some extent, but, um, but I think this is the right format to do that. So uh, if we want to dig into deeper into a particular topic, we'll bring it, we'll do it here. We'll bring in, I don't know, uh, Ankar Gatte or Greg Salamieri or some of our other philosophers, Tara Smith or, or maybe others to talk more deeply about a philosophical issue, um, and, and we'll do it on this show, Living objecti uh, Objectivism. Again, uh, love to hear from you about topics you're, you're interested about, both. So if, if you want, write to me about this particular show, AOI Radio at iCloud.com. There's also a Yaron Brooks show uh, Facebook page where there's an ongoing list of topics which I look at, and I'm definitely going to use that as a source for future shows. So uh, that list of topics, and thank you for those of you who organized it, um, that list of topics will be a source for me, and if you want to add topics to that, go to the Facebook page, add, you know, ask to be added to closed group, it has to be added to the group, and, um, and we, will, uh, we, will add you, uh, we will add you to it. Um, Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting a, a post here that recommends that I share an iCal Apple Calendar subscription with you so you get updates, alerts for all your shows. Um, maybe, I don't know, I don't know how to do that. Maybe, maybe what I'll do is, I think the best thing is for all of you to subscribe to the Facebook page, you on Book Show. Also, that all of you follow me on Facebook and on Twitter. And what I will try to do is I will try to make announcements on Facebook, on Twitter, on Blog Talk Radio, and everything else uh, uh, further in advance so that you can plan better. Uh, so as soon as I know, I will put it up on Facebook, put it up on Twitter, put it up on the, on the new Facebook page and everything else. I mean, adding another calendar or another mechanism by which I communicate with you guys is just too much of a hassle. Sorry, as much as I love you, it, it's just too, uh, it, it just becomes too hard uh, to do it all. Um, so, uh, wait a minute. Are you guys hearing? The, it should be. I don't know why some people are complaining about, uh, uh, no sound on Facebook live. There should be sound. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. What else? Uh, what else? Logistics. What else? Logistics. As I said, some people are, are joining now. As I said, they, you know, please sign up for my YouTube channel. Sign up for soundcloud channel uh listen to as much of the show these shows as possible on the blaze the, the more the blaze gets a sense that a lot of people are actually you know actually listening to the show uh the more it the more likely it is right the more likely it is that they will continue and expand the show and do more marketing around the show so we really if you guys can help me show them that the show is successful by listening to it through one of their channels, that would be incredibly helpful. Uh, so um, anyway, any questions? If you have any questions, you can call the show, 347-324-3075, 347-324-3075. So any questions about the logistics, any questions about the nature of the shows, um, you can call now, 347-324-3075. Once we get into productiveness, 
let's try to focus the questions on that. Now, I do have one call already, uh, so I assume this is more logistics questions because we haven't even started talking about any kind of issues. Hi, Yon Yon Bookshow. Who's this? Good evening, Dr. Book. This is Skylar. Hey, Skylar. I, I, I guess I had to hang up on you on the blaze because I ran out of time. No, I think my call failed. It wasn't on your end. All right, all right. Well, anyway, thanks for calling. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. I, it, it was a privilege, another sense of the word, <laughs> meeting <laughs> you at Ocon 2017. I truly appreciated the entire week. It was exhilarating. It was intellectual ammunition and spiritual fuel the whole time. And uh, I don't have a question, just comments. <laughs> well, well, fantastic. I mean, I'm really glad you, you enjoyed Ocon, and I hope you come to all of them now. And for all of you listening, Objectivist Conferences, uh, it's a fabulous six days of, of spending your time surrounded by people who share your values. Uh, it, it's a fantastic place to uh, both get, get educated with, with exciting talks, get motivated by, by motivating talks, to get uh, re-energized. And many people who go don't want to leave. Many people who go, uh, you know, get a real down after they leave. And, but it's, uh, you know, Skyler was, Skyler asked tons of questions during the sessions. You were really involved and engaged and looked like you really had a good time. So I'm glad you came. And, 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 and by the way, Skyler, are you there? You gone? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. I, I, and, uh, by the way, next year, it's in uh, Newport Beach, California, so not far from where I live. Just signed up. You already signed up. That's fantastic. Thanks, Kyle. I appreciate the call. And, uh, with for, my dad. With your dad. Skyler's dad. Can I say that's your dad, what your dad does for a living? Well, he's retired now. What he did for a living? He was in manufacturing. Oh, okay. He told me something different. All right. <laughs> no, he's a minister now. He's a minister now. He's a minister. There you go. So Skylar's dad's a minister. So that that must make for great Sunday, you know, Sunday evening uh, conversations or Sunday morning or whatever yes, sir. conversations. All right, great, Skylar. So come with your dad. Uh, you know, maybe we'll convert him. We'll see. We're working on it. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> great. So all of you out there, I hope I hope you all come to Ocon 2018 in Newport Beach, California, at the Marriott Hotel. It's a great event. I think if you sign up. Before the end of this month, there's a big discount. And I think the website's already up, Ocon 2018. Uh, so you should definitely go and sign up. Massive discount if you sign up before uh, the end of the month. Skyler already has. I'm sure lots of other people already have. This year at, in Pittsburgh, it was the largest objectivist, conf largest objectivist conference in human history. Uh, 55 off. Oh, I just somebody on the chat corrected me. 55% off before tomorrow. Huh. Okay. So it wasn't the end of the month. It's before the 20th of June. If you sign up before tomorrow, 55% off. So go to Ocon 2018. You can, um, you, you know, if you do a search, you can find it on uh, online. Well, you know, Holly's saying it's the wrong side of the country. Give me a break. We live in an era of airplanes. There is no wrong side of the country. If I can go around the world to give talks in Mongolia... You can come to California, sunny, beautiful, unbelievable California, to attend a uh, you know a, a, a fantastic conference that I, I think you'll uh, you will love. You will love. So all of you, um, sign up before tomorrow so you can get fifty five percent fifty. Wow, that that's a massive discount. There are no excuses. I expect five hundred people to register by tomorrow. Uh, to take advantage of this uh, this massive discount, so everybody, everybody who's on the show right now, um, you know, go sign up. All right, um, let's see, let's see. All right, so um, any questions on uh, on the logistics? Hopefully not. Hopefully, is everybody set? Everybody realize what they have to do. They have to go sign up and follow me everywhere, and. Say Share, share. Social media is not about comments. It's not about liking. It's not, none of that matters. None of that matters. The only thing that matters in social media, the only way to really measure um, success with social media is by sharing or in Twitter retweeting. So um, share. You got to share, share, share. Now, I know. I know, I know. 
I've spoken up against sharing often, but this is not a sacrifice. This is a win-win, right? This is supporting a value and supporting your friends because they get to share with you something that doesn't cost you anything and that they're going to benefit enormously from. So, um, all right, go share and uh, share the show. Uh, share, you know, the, 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 the channel, share the, I don't know. I don't know, you know, the language is getting ridiculous with all this different social media stuff. But, the uh, you know, hopefully by the end of July, everything will be up, everything, all the websites, the, the, the Patreon, the, the YouTube Live, the Facebook Live, the, 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 I don't know. Periscope is it called? I don't even know this stuff. And maybe even, maybe even we'll do something on um, Instagram. Instagram is the future, they tell me. Okay, now, talking about being productive, which is what I'm talking about, right? You know, producing stuff, producing content, and then, and then marketing it. Marketing is a productive activity, and, uh, and getting it out there, and getting it into the world, and, uh, and, you know, really having an impact. And um, that's what we're trying to do here. So I need your help. And I hope you help me with it. Okay, today let's let's do the mental shift, and uh, and please, as I said, give us a call if you have a question about productiveness. If you have a if you have a comment about productiveness, or if there's any particular aspect of this virtue that you'd like to discuss. But one of the the idea of productiveness was really the theme of the Ocon 2017 conference, and one of the reasons we picked it as a theme is that it was at it was in Pittsburgh, and I don't know how many of you know much about Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, but Pittsburgh was really one of the hubs of the American Industrial Revolution. It was one of the places in which the Industrial Revolution was really uh, happened uh, during the 19th century in America. And, and Pittsburgh flourished really until the 1950s uh, in America and, and has been, unfortunately, in a steady decline since then. Although I have to say that it's a beautiful, beautiful city. It's been cleaned up. Uh, and, and, and just gorgeous, gorgeous views, uh, and uh, the downtown is nice, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really is a, a wonderful place, but the focus was really on productiveness, and, and the focus, I think, at the conference was primarily on kind of a, a particular aspect of productiveness, and that is the, the love, the love that, as an objectivist, one holds towards ability, towards success, towards production, towards greatness in the field of production. And how that is at the heart, at the core of the philosophy of objectivism. Ankar Gatti gave a great talk, which will be up online at some point, about uh, relating that love of ability, love of success, love of production, love of productiveness, uh, to the Industrial Revolution and relating that to Ayn Rand's ability to develop objectivism. She had said she could have never come up with the uh, with ideas behind rational egoism unless she had witnessed, through history, the success of the Industrial Revolution, the role of reason in human mind, of the human mind, the role of ability, the, 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 the ability of human beings to create the kind of wealth that was created during the Industrial Revolution, and, and it's still being created around us today. So, um, y y you know, it's, it's, this is a crucial part of, um, of objectivism, is this idea of the importance of productiveness. So, so let's go over it a little bit. And again, here, I would recommend everybody, everybody read the section on productiveness in OPA. And maybe, maybe in the future... What I'll do is uh, when I announce a topic like this, I will give you some recommended readings to do before the show. And then, uh, yeah, I think that will enhance stuff. And then you can also you can do the readings and you can also have prepared questions and have prepared comments uh, about the readings. And, um, yeah, all right, so, so we'll do that. Uh, Angela's taking notes. She's listening in. And, uh, and she'll make sure that I try to provide you some basic reading in the topic. But generally... If you haven't read OPA by Dr. Leonard Peikoff, uh, Objectivism, The Philosophy of Ayn Rand, which is the only really systemic presentation in writing of the entire philosophy, you should. And, and uh, his subsections, his subchapters on things like productiveness and other things are, are crucial 
from my understanding of the objectivist philosophy and for everybody's understanding and really seeing it as a system. So why is productiveness so important in objectivism? Well, because of man's nature, because of the particular animal man human beings are. We are a being that does not have the ability to survive, to thrive in nature by just picking berries and uh, I don't know, what else can you do? Pick ber- I mean, there's almost nothing we can do in the world out there. There's almost nothing we can do to help us survive that does not require the use of human reason, that does not apply, require the application of reason to the problem of human survival. So human beings do not survive by just embracing their environment. This is, by the way, one of the things that makes the environmentalist movement so very evil. It is the fact that it rejects this very principle. It rejects this idea that human beings do not survive by embracing their environment. Human beings survive by changing their environment. Human beings survive by taking the environment and adapting it to themselves, adapting it to their own lives, to their own needs and our constantly growing, constantly changing, constantly evolving needs. So I don't mean needs in the narrow, what is Meslovian sense of air and water and food. I mean needs in the fullest sense of needing a Beethoven symphony and needing computers and needing the internet and needing everything that you as a modern human being need in order to live a successful, flourishing life. But even at the most primitive level, Even at the end of the day, at the level of food, at the level of clothing, at the level of shelter, human beings cannot just survive by just being in their environment and by adapting to it. Now, every other animal can. Plants just accept their environment. And uh, if they can't, if they can't find water by going their root system looking for it, or if, they, or if they can't find sunshine by moving their leaves around and trying to position themselves to get the sunshine, they die. But they either have to adapt to the environment around them or they die. If you take a cheetah and put him in, uh, you know, the, the ice cold of northern Europe, he'll die. If you take a polar bear and put him in somewhere very, very warm, I, you know, I think he'll die. I'm not sure. But there's no way for them to adapt the environment to their needs because basically animals are, for them, you know, pre-programmed, if you will, to deal with a particular set of conditions, a particular environment in which they have evolved to live. And when that environment changes, they are wiped out. Look at the dinosaurs. The environment changes, they're wiped out. Not all life on Earth was wiped out, but the, 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 the dinosaurs were wiped out because they couldn't evolve fast enough. Evolution takes too long to allow you to adapt biologically, evolutionarily, to a changing environment. Now, human beings are very different. Human beings from the very beginning require, require changing their environment for their own needs. And if you can't change your environment, that's when human beings would die, or at least most human beings would die off. A few might survive barely by, by picking berries and collecting nuts. But a very small population of human beings could survive that way, and we can't build shelters, and if we can't build fires, and if we can't do all the things that actually require changing our environment, then w- we would die off as a species. But we don't. Because we do change our environment, right? I mean, we're not biologically designed to deal with cold. We're not biologically designed to beat the saber-toothed tiger. We're not biologically designed, if you will, to survive really in this world. It requires effort. It requires a particular type of effort. It requires a mental effort and then the willingness and the ability to execute our knowledge by changing our environment around us. So from agriculture, which somebody had to discover the principles behind some genius scientist 
who discovered the relationship between a seed and a plant and water to turning that into agriculture, which is a, a, an engineering business, entrepreneurial type of activity. Some genius, some Bill Gates of the time figuring out, okay, there's a relationship between these things. Now I can turn this into an entire industry. Right? To clothing, to figuring out how to build a hut, to figuring out how to build a skyscraper, to figuring out how, do you know how a computer works? I certainly don't. I mean, I kind of know in vague theory, but I have no real knowledge of how a computer works. Um, even though I, I studied it, you know, I'm an engineer. That's kind of embarrassing. But all that requires huge amounts of knowledge, huge amounts of knowledge. Just seeking knowledge, the activity of seeking knowledge is at the core of what it means to be productive. It's at the core of the virtue of productiveness. It's the idea of using one's mind to solve the problem of human existence, of your own existence, of your material needs, the material needs that you acquire in order to exist. So that's what the essence of productiveness is. And it's, it's a human requirement. We, we just cannot survive without it. Somebody has to think and act on those thoughts to change the environment around them in order to make, all, to make the, the, the materials that we need, the material world, in which we live, hospitable to human life, because nature surely ain't. Nature is not hospitable to human life. We need to change our environment in order to make it hospitable. Again, this is the core of why the environmentalist movement is so evil, because it rejects this idea. It wants us, it wants us to actively stop, to prevent us from changing the environment. In other words, it wants to, to prevent us from engaging in the activity that is necessary for our own survival. All right. All right. So if you have any questions, comments, any areas you'd want to take this conversation, 347 324 3075. So Leonard Peikoff, in his uh, in Opa, discusses the fact that every virtue has a material and a spiritual dimension to it. Completely integrated. There is no mind-body dichotomy uh, in objectivism. So mind and body are integrated. But there are aspects. And there's a material aspect, a body aspect, and a, and a spiritual aspect, a, a mind aspect. And this idea of, of human existence, human material existence, and the need to solve the problem of human existence, the need to change our environment is that you know, body side. That's the, the, the material side of uh, the virtue of productiveness. All right, we've got a call. Uh, hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Hi, this is Dan Harris, Iran. How are you? Hey, Dan. Good. How about you? All right. Um, I just wanted to, um, I guess, ask for some clarification on the role of government in environmental considerations, if any. I'll give you an example. And my, my, I'm coming from the perspective of an objective this work. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I agree that a lot of the environmental movement is irrational and they're trying to basically destroy human productiveness. But I want to play the advocate of the most rational part of that. So let's say, as an example, for a historic example, CFCs which, you know, the, 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 the seeds released in the air ended up mixing with ozone and neutralizing it, and it's been discovered that ozone uh, absorbs some uh, potentially dangerous UV rays. So um, I guess I, I, I agree. So let's say I'm, a, I'm an environmentalist. I agree humans should shape their environment, but at the same time, like, I don't think you have the right to – create an environment that is less inhabitable or more dangerous or something like that. So is there a role in the government in that, in those kinds of areas where it can be shown scientifically that let's say removing the oxygen from the atmosphere is, you know, bad. So you shouldn't do that. Yeah. Or yeah. Ozone. So is that a, ba is that a baby like on your lap? 
or a cat? <laughs> yeah, it's my it's my ten month old. It's your ten month old. old. <laughs> oh, That's very cute. Um, so uh, let's let's try to separate out the, the scientific questions and the and in the core of what you're asking because I don't want to get into the scientific questions because I don't know enough about them. Um, but look. And, and let's also differentiate between what you're asking, and I think you did that, but, but between the, the essence of the environmentalist movement, which is what the environmentalist intellectuals are really driving at. Um, what we want, if, if the issue is um, a safe environment, an environment in which uh, human beings are not doing things that damage the health and safety of other human beings. Uh, you know, if that's the case, then, yeah, the government has a role to play in, in that. And it always has played or, or mostly has played a role in that. And I believe that if, if, um, if we had a healthier court system and if we had a healthier government focused on the protection of individual rights, it could deal with many of these environmental issues, real, the real environmental issues that come up. So, so in the case of, uh, you know, dirty water, dirty air, you know, everybody's for clean water, clean air, uh, you know, you can't spew out stuff from your factory that, that, that hurts me. That one's relatively easy because a legal system would penalize the people who spew out the stuff that's clearly damaging to me and, uh, and take away the incentive to continue doing it. If it was harmful enough, you could even imagine a law passed saying you can't just spew cyanide into the air because it kills people, right? So it would be completely legitimate once the science was established, once the science was unequivocal, that there was uh, there were certain actions that some people were taking, and it was clear that it was causing real damage to other people. That it should be stopped, right? That that you know it cannot continue. Yeah. Um, it's okay. a little bit. That seems very closely aligned with what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, now it, it's a little it's, tricky. So it is tricky because. There are periods in history and there are times in which, for example, the 19th century, where the very nature of progress and industrialization requires polluting the air. Um, so you have to take, so for example, you know, uh, coal is so cheap and so plentiful. It's the only way in which the Industrial Revolution can get going. But there's no question that, that burning coal all over London um, it created soot in the air. The soot in the air that was being breathed in by people was, was hurting people, was damaging them. You can't, but you can't then say, okay, we're going to stop the Industrial Revolution because it's hurting some people. So there has to be, you have to take into account the significance of what is being done, the extent to which it is done, and the big picture. So, for example, in the 19th century, the big picture was life expectancy almost doubled in spite of the fact that there was soot in there, right? And it doubled because of the wealth created by coal, and which allowed for investment in research and in hospitals and in, uh, in uh, sanitary, sanitation, like building of sewage and building of all, you know, uh, clean water and, and, and all this stuff. So it, it, it has to, whatever these laws are, they have to take that into account. So it's not okay, simple. So, it's, so the whole thing is not simple. So for example... You can't tomorrow say, you know what, uh, you know, I don't know if, the, let's say it was scientifically true that the stuff that automobiles spew out of their, their um, exhaust is, you know, reduces people's lifespan by fill in the blank, by some amount, right? By a month, by a year, I don't know, whatever it is, right? So you can't say, okay, we're banning automobiles from California. Oh, we're going to raise the price of automobiles by $5,000 in order to put in some system that makes it cleaner. At the end of the day, the automobile is part of life. You know, you can't, you can't just eradicate it in the name of, in a world in which life expectancy is increasing, you know, to save a month from the total life expectancy. At the end of the day, if you really value that extra month more than you value automobiles, then you move to Montana, right? So leave California leave Los Angeles, and move somewhere else. That should be a choice, and, and people should make that decision. That's, that's taking your life seriously. It's up to the individual to evaluate the trade-off in those situations. Right? There's no question, for example, that working in a coal mine is dangerous. 
and probably reduces on average life expectancy. You can't ban coal mine work because of that. But as long as that information is known, people make a choice, and, and it's a voluntary choice to work in a coal mine. So it's not obvious how to apply all these things. You see what I mean? Yes, I do. And I think you made another good point, and that is depending on the scientific certainty. And yeah. I, I feel like that's like two problems in this culture. One is this environmental movement, but there also is the atrophy of the science you know, scientific method and its applications. And so absolutely. I mean, so much, so much of science, the statistical models. modeling and, and, yeah. and the probability yeah. theory. And then uh, it, w with regard to this, and then the other thing is there's this principle is the principle that, that you, you don't want to do anything that might cause damage, even if you don't know it will cause damage. So um, I forget the principle, the, the precautionary principle, right? Don't do anything you can. So what the, the expectation is scientifically today is, that before you introduce a new technology, you have to prove a negative, that it won't do any damage, which is impossible. And so the standards of the FDA for drug approval, the standards at the PEPA for environmental stuff are so high because the burden of proof is on those who claim that it's safe. And that's ludicrous. Right, another misapplication of scientific principles. Yes, and, and very few people understand the scientific method. Not that I'm an expert and not that I'm going to articulate what the scientific method is right now, but I don't think the scientific no, method no. is <laughs> this, uh, this idea of falsifiability and this idea that comes out of, uh, oh, the name of the philosopher just escaped my mind, uh, but, uh, you know, this whole 20th century tradition of, of, of science, which I think is a, is, a, is, a, is a false approach to the scientific method. So it, it muddies the waters in dramatic fashion. What truly is hurting human life and, and what is not? What really is a danger and what is not? What way the government should intervene because it's protecting individual rights and why should it just leave us alone to make decisions about risk that I believe adults can make decisions about? You know, poor people got on, in the 19th century, poor people in... in um, Europe got on boats and traveled to America without a penny in their pocket to start a new life. If somebody in LA feels like it, the LA is too polluted, get off your butt, get in your car uh, and drive to Montana and live there, or Wyoming and live there. Not that the people in Montana and Wyoming will particularly thank me for shipping all those losers to you. But, but yeah, I mean, if you value clean air more than civilization, there's plenty of places in the world and in the United States with clean air. So just do it. So let individuals make those kind of choices about them. Yeah, Karl Papa is the name of the philosopher um, who I met, who I think who I think did a lot of harm to the scientific method, to the post scientific method. But I can't talk about it because I don't know anything about it. Well, I don't know enough. I know enough just to be dangerous. So we'll have to have an expert on sometime to talk about the scientific method and Karl Papa. Um, does, so does that all make sense? It does. Good. And, I, you know, I, I work in an environment where I'm with a rational leftist, like, and he's compartmentalized. So on these issues, like, it seems completely irrational, and on other issues, he's, he's completely rational. But at least it's fun to have these debates. And so he brought up that where I was coming from was from his perspective. So thank you yeah. for helping me all. Helping yeah, and, and you know, history. again, if you can objectively, scientifically prove that something is causing damage to human life and that something is not a requirement for civilization that is going to cause you know then then there's a viable case for the courts and the legislature ultimately getting involved and banning it but it, the, the burden is very high it's very difficult and uh, there usually are the mechanisms of which to deal with the situation all right good all right, thank you so much Brown. sure sure uh thanks for calling i appreciate uh, the involvement um, let's see. So where were we? So productiveness, every virtue, every virtue has a material application and a, um, and a spiritual application to the material application of productiveness seems to be pretty straightforward, right? You produce the stuff that you need in order to survive. You produce the stuff that is a requirement of human life, clothing, shelter, food, and everything else. Um, but it's more than that, right? It's not just, and, and the objectivist ethics is very clear about this. Life is not just to be lived okay, right? Life is not just to be lived 
you know, having water and food and shelter and whatever. But human needs, human wants and human needs are endless. So it's the ongoing, continuous production of material values that is productiveness. It's in a sense never settling. It's always being engaged in that process of creation. It's what, you know, to a large extent makes us human, that process of creation, that process of production, that process of, of manifesting our ideas, intellectual ideas, artistic ideas, you know, scientific ideas, production ideas, business ideas, manifestation of all the ideas in reality. That's what gives them a reality. That's an essential part of what it means to be human. It's to produce, it's to make at whatever level of ability you have. To make and to produce guided by your reason, again, at whatever level of ability you have. It's that taking your ideas and applying them to reality, whether you're a street sweeper or nuclear engineer or an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, is, is the, the, the use of the mind applying it to a problem and solving that problem in reality out there, creating something, building something, making something, doing something different. And that's what life is about. And that's what work should be about. It should be about producing, creating, making, applying one's reason. It's so sad. It's so sad. And we get the spiritual element. The spiritual element is more, even more dramatically so, for, to see people just going through the motions, in a sense, negating being a human being, just acting like an animal, doing what they're told, not engaging their mind in the activity they're involved in, not engaging their mind in making the world around them, in one way or another, a better world. Okay. So being productive, Creating, building is an essential, essential uh, virtue in, uh, in objectivism. Now, what is, its, uh, what is the purpose? Virtues, after all, are actions. Uh, actions that lead to the good life. Actions that lead to happiness. Actions that lead to the attainment of values. What is the primary value? What is the central value that uh, productiveness is targeted at achieving? Well, in a sense, it's necessary for the achievement of all values, right? You need to produce in order to consume. You need to produce in, uh, you know, in order to achieve the value of reason because you're using rationality in production. So rationality is the recognition of reason as a means of, of, of knowledge, a means of survival. So... Productiveness really is a way, and, and of course, it's a necessary means of attaining self-esteem, and we'll get to that in a little while. But the one thing that it's really directly related to is the value of purpose. Whoops. I had the, my book open to a particular passage, and of course, that's gone. Wait. Purpose. Purpose is one of the objectives, cardinal values. Reason, purpose, and self-esteem. Purpose means that you have a goal in everything in mind in life, that you have a hierarchy of values, that you are actively working to pursue, that you have something in mind in every activity that you engage in in life, that it's not random, that it's not whatever you feel like doing, that it isn't just cruising through life, that there actually is a focal point, a purpose, a direction, a goal, that all your activities are leading towards, right? So I'm, I'm going to retry, try to find this uh, section that uh, I lost. Wait, it's gone. Oh, wait. I wanted to quote something about purpose. Um, oh, wait. Hmm. Okay, doesn't matter. So in every activity in life, in everything we do, we should have a purpose and a goal. Think of how it would work. Everything he does, even when he's relaxing, is purposeful. The purpose might be to properly relax. And what does it take to properly relax? And how does one properly relax? And with whom does one sh 
choose to properly relax or go on vacations or have, have, a, have a good time. Th- that's not random. That, too, is, is, is essentialized. Everything in Howard Works life is, in a sense, goal, purpose, directed. If you think about all the heroes of Ayn Rand's books. Think about Ayn Rand. She came to the United States, young girl, with nothing, with, with some English, but nowhere near the kind of knowledge of the English language that would allow her to write a novel like Atlas Shrugged. Everything in her life, from the moment she arrived in America till the publication of Atlas Shrugged, was targeted towards the publication of Atlas Shrugged, even though she didn't have Atlas Shrugged in mind. But she knew she had to learn English because she wanted to be a writer. She knew they had to write and write and write and figure it out and become a better and better writer and use English and study English and learn English and know English. Read and write, read and write, read and write. Even if she had to do jobs that were, you know, relatively meaningless to her, still productive, she was still real good at them, but that allowed her to earn enough money so she could in the evenings really, really devote herself to a true productive activity, which was writing. You know, so she worked as a clerk in the wardrobe department, became head of that department, but that was just a means to a proper productiveness goal, which was the writing. But everything, everything was focused towards one productive purpose, right? And so purpose, this idea that we have to have a purpose in all that we do. We have to have a reason to do it. We have to have a goal to which we're striving towards. And it can be happiness. Happiness is the outcome from achieving one's values. Happiness is not something you drive towards. Happiness is what happens to you. you know, it happens to you, sounds too passive. It, it happens within you when you exercise the, your virtues to attain your values. It's the outcome. It's the consequence. Right? I mean, here's a quote that Phoenix has uh, put up on, on, uh, on the chat. The man of purpose defines explicitly his abstract values and then... In every area, the specific object he seeks to gain, i.e. the values, and the means by which to gain them. So whether it's objects, whether it's knowledge, whatever it is, in every realm of your life, romantic realm, uh, your, your, your career, we'll talk about career in a minute, uh, your family, how you treat your kids, your vacation, in every one of those realms, You should know what you're trying to achieve. You should know what you're striving towards. You should figure out what will lead to you achieving and succeeding in order to achieve your goals. And you should make those as explicit as you can. Now, you can't always because it involves the future and involves certain uncertainties. But to the extent you can, you figure it out. You plan. And you... Create a hierarchy of values based on how important they are in achieving your purpose, in achieving your goals, in achieving your values. Right? So productive activity, productive activity is is at the end of the day where we spend most of our life, most of our time. And there's a spiritual value for that. There's an existential reason for that. Because many of us still need to work all of our lives, to produce income all of our lives, in order to sustain all the other values that we want. A home, a computer, uh, you know, uh, 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 the opera, all the other things that require, that require us to sustain the income. But even if you become fabulously rich because of your work, why then do people continue working? Because it's the one area of our life in which we apply reason consistently. We're always challenged mentally. Our minds are always being challenged. We're always pushing ourselves. We we'll always have the opportunities to be creative, to do new things, to push the envelope. That's why wealthy people continue working. Because... It's fun, and this goes to the spiritual aspect of, uh, of, uh, of productiveness. Because it's the application of reason, because reason 
is such an important value. We have to exercise it. We have to challenge ourselves. We have to push ourselves. And when we do that, when we push ourselves and exercise our reason and achieve and succeed and attain values, what is the reward for that? Well, that's the third cardinal value that Ayn Rand uh, identifies, right? That's self-esteem. So when we apply reason to purpose, apply reason to purpose, we get self-esteem. And our self-esteem allows us, because we, we're confident in ourselves, we feel at home in this world, that allows us to take on even bigger challenges. That allows us to, 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 to you know, to uh, push ourselves even further in terms of our career, in terms of our purpose, and in terms of applying reason, applying our rational, rationality, our minds, to greater and greater challenges, greater and greater things, you know? Like, like I'm trying to do with this uh, podcasting stuff and uh, radio stuff and uh, all these shows, right? Taking it to the next level. Taking it to the next level. Ah, you guys are cheating. You're looking up the Ayn Rand lexicon on the purpose in, uh, in, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thumbing through um, OPA. See OPA right there? OPA? Ah, the camera doesn't work quite right. There we go. So um, you should all be reading OPA. Um, so let me, let me first say before we, I, I want to talk more about the spiritual value of productiveness. But, you know, one of the things that I've mentioned many times on the show, and I actually get a lot of flack from some objectivists for this, uh, is how much I admire Silicon Valley and how much I admire the people who work in Silicon Valley and the entrepreneurs and the creation. And even people who I, I you know, politically, I'm completely opposed to, I don't know, Zuckerberg and, uh, and, and most of the CEOs of Silicon Valley. What I admire about these people is their sense of purpose. They have a vision. They have an idea and they dedicate it to that idea. And they work hard and they change the world by focusing, using their mind to achieve that vision that they have, to achieve that purpose that they've set for themselves. And they don't settle. So you don't find, uh, I don't know, Apple saying, okay, we, we, we did the personal computer. That's fine. We're done. Right? Steve Jobs had to do an iPhone and an iPad. And then I watch, and even though other words came out after him, and he, he was trying to solve the problem of television, he would say. And, he, you know, he was always, always trying to solve problems, applying his mind constantly, constantly throughout his adulthood to problems that existed in the world. And, and drove himself, drove himself, worked incredibly hard, put the team together that he drove to work very, very hard in order to solve. So, I mean, the amount of respect I have for people like that is unbelievable versus armchair objectivists who sit at home and spend most of their time on Facebook and Twitter complaining about the world, bitching and complaining about the risks and the dangers and, oh, my God, how bad things are, and using objectivism as an excuse for their own failure in life and in their careers. Right? And then... Blaming the people in Silicon Valley who actually have a life, have a career, have a purpose, have, have embraced Ayn Rand's core moral virtues implicitly. Complaining about those people because they get their politics wrong. Now, I complain about those people because they get their politics wrong. But first I say, wow. First I say, thank you. And first I say, they are unbelievable moral people. Here's what Dr. Peacock writes in OPA about this, right? Ayn Rand is the first thinker to reject the mind-body dichotomy methodologically by reference to the theory of reality and of concepts. We'll get to that at some point, not today. That is why she is also the first fully to practice the virtue of justice in the present context. She is the first to identify, in terms of philosophical system, the source of wealth, and therefore the proper estimate of those who create it. Next paragraph. A productive man is a moral man, period. Let me repeat that. 
A productive man is a moral man. In a more intellectually demanding and innovating field, he is the epitome of morality. He deserves to be admired accordingly. Oh, I love that paragraph. Let me repeat it because this so applies to Silicon Valley. A productive man is a moral man. In the more intellectually demanding and innovative field, he is the epitome of morality. He deserves to be admired accordingly. Wow. And this relates to the idea of love of ability, which Ayn Rand had. Think about all the heroes in her books and think about all the talks to businessmen. The love of ability. And I love the people in Silicon Valley because of the amazing things that they create and they produce. Now, it's not limited to Silicon Valley. I love businessmen all over this country. But what is it? What does it say here? Oops, where did it go? The more intellectually demanding and innovative fields. I mean, the valley and everything it represents is demanding, intellectually demanding. It's taking, cutting its science and turning it into products that make my life and your life and everybody's life better. It doesn't get any better than that. It doesn't get any more admirable than that. Now, yeah, when they do something politically horrible, you have to attack them. You have to condemn them. But within the context of how admirable they are as producers. And if you take that approach, if you take the approach of admiring productive ability, admiring and loving productive ability, loving, admiring, Production and people of production and viewing productive production as moral, productiveness as this key virtue, then you know this applies to immigrants who come here to work, to produce, to create. Yeah, some of them are bums. Some of them come here to leech off the system. Condemn them. But respect the ones who don't. Respect to one who want, who want to have a who want to make and create and build and produce. Don't start slashing back at immigration when people want to come to this country because it's still free enough for them to be able to be productive. Right? Now somebody's asking about Elon Musk. Look, Elon Musk to be a crony, to be a in a sense to base your all your production on government favors that's not productiveness that's you know that's being a crook that's and a crook is not productive right now elon musk is this real mixed case and i have a huge love hate relationship with him on the one hand he made his money at paypal which was real innovation real production and he has a vision to going to mars in 30 years which i think is just astounding for an entrepreneur to have a 30-year vision and to put in place a program to actually achieve that vision. Talk about goal-directed action. Talk about having a purpose in life. I mean, that's amazing, right? And, and I don't resent the fact that he gets his money in the space program from government because that's really right now the way the economy is structured, the only way to get it. But I resent his solar energy plans. I resent his Tesla plans. It's not just that he take government loan. He, he, he gets subsidized heavily, heavily, heavily by all these people, right? So uh, Elon Musk is a very mixed case. He's very difficult to have the right attitude towards, and I have a very mixed view of Elon Musk as a consequence. Look, life is not simple where you can just say, you know, you just cut and dry, admire, hate, admire, hate, admire, hate. There's some mixed cases. I admire and hate uh, Elon Musk, right? Now, we're going to get to a question Ethan asked um, in a few minutes. Uh, but, but, so let me, let me deal. Let's say, so so I, I just want to make the case that it, it, being productive is, is at the core of what it means to be moral and being successful at production, 
requires that one be successful, at least in the realm of production. In uh, the other virtues of objectivism, you're not going to be successful in your career, in production, if you're not honest, if you don't have integrity, if you don't have a sense of justice in the way you treat your employees, if you don't have pride. Think of Steve Jobs. Right? And of course, if you're not rational, forget it. Right? So achievement and success in productiveness, in uh, you know, in the world of production is an indication, at least, that in that realm of life, at least, you have been a moral person. You have been honest, you've had integrity, and you have used your mind. And what is more important in objectivism than the fact that you have used your mind to better your life, to solve the problems that exist around you, to make life, to make the world a better place. I mean, that's just... So to me, again, the people in Silicon Valley are incredible productive and, and they're being egoistic about it. I mean, and you watch them, you see them, you see the level of enjoyment, you see the fun they have, you see the excitement they have in bringing out a new product, the fun they have in starting a company and innovating and producing and being serial entrepreneurs. And even after you've made $20 billion, doing it all again and going for more, right? Think of Michael Dell, who's, I don't know, worth $20 billion. He just risked a huge amount of his wealth and taking uh, his company, Dell, private and then uh, merging it with EMC, I think it's EMC, with the largest takeover in technology history, right? And, and trying to create something even bigger than Dell ever was. And maybe in the process of becoming the richest man in the world. But I can tell you, Michael Dell doesn't know what to do with the money he already has. There's no way he can spend it. But why is money important in that place? Because it's a way to measure how successful you are. It's a way to measure how productive you've been. I mean, think of the virtue that that takes. Think of the rationality that takes, the drive, the purposefulness that that takes. And the self-esteem. I made $20 billion. I'm going to make another. I mean, wow. So I love these guys. I love these people. And their politics, you know, if that were the only problem in the world, we could solve it. Everybody was as productive and creative and innovative and purposefulness and rational as people in Silicon Valley, then we could deal. We could deal with their politics. I'm, I'm convinced we can convince them that their politics is wrong. But try to convince people who don't want to work. Try to convince people who don't use their minds. Try to convince people who drift through life who don't engage with reality, to be moral. That's much harder. That is so much more hard. So um, anyway, that's, again, my pitch for Silicon Valley. You'll get that a lot from me because nothing ticks me off more than objectivists who, uh, who condemn and, and berate uh, the great entrepreneurs of our era uh, and who focus exclusively on politics as if politics is a primary when when morality is is so much more important and and you know commit the injustice the injustice i believe it's an injustice of not recognizing the the, the amazing achievements of the great entrepreneurs of our era i mean we we, we complain and bemoan about uh, how the robber barons were treated but if we as objectivists don't treat the great industrialists, the great innovators, the great producers of today with respect. And what do we expect of other people who are not objectivists, how they treat, how to treat the, um, the, you know, the, 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 the great producers of the 19th century. All right, I found that the, the, the quotes on, um, on purpose. So he, here it is, uh, you know, explicitly. The principle of purpose means conscious goal directedness in every aspect of one's existence where choice supplies, right? The man of purpose defines explicitly his abstract values and then in every area, the specific objects to seek and gain by means of which to gain them, right? I think that was uh, the quote I, I had before. He is the person with a passionate ambition for values. I love this quote, right? So the, the man of purpose, right? The man of purpose. 
is a person with a passionate ambition for values. He knows what he loves. He knows what he wants. He knows what he wants to act, to gain or keep. He cherishes it. It's a man who wants every moment and step in his life to count in their service. There's no downtime. There's something to be gained. There's a purpose to every activity. Now, again, relaxation, there's a purpose for relaxation. So I'm not saying oh, you have to work you know, all the time. Ooh, wow, I'm making faces on Facebook Live. That's quite, quite entertaining. You guys are missing, missing out. Um, You know, the process of pursuing values is itself a value. That is getting yourself into that process of thinking in that way, of going after your values, identifying them, knowing what you love, having a high key, what's more important, what's less important, what are you going after now, what are you going after later? And watching those values evolve as you evolve, as you grow up, as you mature, as your context of knowledge changes. Man, that is so much fun. And that, that means a dynamic, exciting career. And this is, this is the thing about productiveness. It's not just about doing work, right? It's about having a purpose, which means having a career because there is no realm of human activity where one can apply purpose. One can strive towards purpose more than in one's career. It is integrates so many of one's values. It integrates so much of one's life. Again, I think I mentioned this earlier. It's not an accident that we spend most of our time at work, not with our family, not watching television, not relaxing on the beach, at work. Even when we're billionaires, we spend most of our time at work. Why? Because it is the, it is the activity that integrates most of our values that we're striving towards. And the most important value, reason, using our minds, challenging ourselves in the realm of thinking. That's the most important thing. And that's where one's career, one's work, if it's good work, if it's the right work, if it's challenging work, that's where one can really do it. And that's why, one, that's why career is so, so fundamentally important to anybody who values his own life. And this relates again, so this is the kind of the spiritual side of the, of the this is the mind side of, of, the, of this issue of productiveness, right? Productiveness is, first of all, material in the sense that I need, I need, the, and, and I need to produce the things in order to, so I can survive, so I can live, so I can thrive, so I can be successful, so I can ha buy a home, so I can go to opera, so I can buy beautiful paintings, so I can do all those things. But it's more than that, right? It's what sustains us spiritually. It's what sustains one emotionally. It's what sustains one's life. It's what makes life interesting and fun. I mean, imagine not having somewhere where you can be challenged every day, where you can push the envelope, where you can be creative, where you could do things in a new way, potentially every day. But that's what work should be. It should be challenging, it should be exciting. It should be pushing you, challenging you, and challenging you in a very particular way for the most part. And that is mentally challenging your mind. Now, granted, if you're an athlete, uh, you're challenging your body primarily, but even there, think about what it takes to be a great athlete today. The discipline, the discipline of mind, and also the science, the, all the, the science that goes into in a sense, producing a great athlete today. It, it, it's not a static thing. And you can't be an athlete. I mean, if you look at the great athletes, they're almost all smart people. And people who take their life seriously. And people who apply their mind to figuring out how to be the best, ath best athlete in the world. How to structure their lives in a way to be the best athletes in the world. And how to you know, overcome temptations and, 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 and really pursue values and stick with those values and be committed to those values. I mean, it's admirable when I see somebody like, you know, Phelps and, and what, he ha what he went through in order to become the greatest swimmer in human history. I mean, people talk about that as a sacrifice. That's bizarre. That was his highest value, his career, his central purpose in life. 
And it's important to have a central purpose in life. Because if you have a central purpose in life, then all your other purposes, you can evaluate them based on how they fit into that central purpose. So you can have at the end of the day, one hierarchy of values instead of competing hierarchies of values. So that all you do in life drives towards one direction. And that central purpose in life is a career. It's hard to imagine a different one. Now, granted, once you retire, once you get old to a certain age, or when you want to do things a little differently, then you have to find a different central purpose. But in a sense, whatever that new central purpose, that hobby or whatever, becomes the equivalent to career. And raising kids for a mother can be a central purpose. Right? You know, managing a household, raising kids, that can be a career. But it needs to be taken seriously. Just like any career should to be taken seriously. And then it has to be the integrating factor that integrates all your values towards one purpose. And this is what keeps us spiritually going, spiritually alive, spiritually engaged, spiritually challenged. In other words, it's what challenges our mind, is having a career, having a purpose, a constant purpose. Now, the purpose can change. The career can change. I mean, serial entrepreneurs, right? They, they change the company. I've had, I don't know, five careers in my life. And... One has to accept that when the, not everybody knows exactly what they want to be in life. You, you, you know, a lot of people, it's not like how it work. I didn't know what I wanted to be in life. I, I didn't really, you know, find what I really wanted to be in life until I was, I don't know, 40. But every time I looked, every time I engaged in some activity, I don't know, civil engineer or, or a student or a, a, a teacher, a professor, that became my central purpose. Now, I always dabbled in other things, and I think I always dabbled in other things because something in me always knew that that was not enough. That whatever it was, being an engineer or being a student or being a, uh, even a teacher was not enough for me, a finance professor. So I always had other stuff going on until I found what I really am passionate about, which is this, right? And it evolves. Right? So, so it's not like you wake up one morning when you're 18, you know exactly what you want to do, and then everything in life is going to f- figure that out, and then you die at 95 having fulfilled exactly that which you woke up at 18 knowing what to do. That's not how life works for most of us. Right? You know, some people it does. They are the how it works. They know exactly what they want to be. And everything is driven towards that, and they succeed in that, and they continue to succeed in that, because, and it's always challenging because there are always new challenges to engage in. And, and, but... That's not everybody. Sometimes you have to try different things. It takes time to find a career often. But every time you try, you put everything you have into it. You take it seriously. And in many respects, the virtual productiveness is about taking your life seriously. Taking reason, purpose, self-esteem seriously. Taking the fact that you have values seriously and then acting in order to attain those values and that's you know you you can't attain values unless you're being productive unless you're creating something and again that's true true at every 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 single level right well, phoenix is mentioning this movie wonder woman she knew what she wanted from when she was very young I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm sworn off all um, superhero movies, so I suspect I'm not even going to see Wonder Woman um, because I've I've sworn off all uh, superhero movies. If you if you if you want to know why, you can ask me. Um, so, any questions? Any questions about productiveness? Uh, you can call three four seven three two four three zero seven five, or you can write a, a short question um, on. Uh, on Facebook Live or in the chat. If you write a short question, I can get it. But uh, you can call 347-324-3075. Any questions on this virtual productiveness, how to apply it, what it means, what it... Okay, we got somebody... We got somebody calling in. Hey, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Hey, Iran. This is Mark Coldren from Michigan. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark's the guy who started the Iran Book Show Facebook page. So thank you, Mark. Really appreciate it and enjoyed meeting you at uh, Ocon. 
Yeah, it was it was great great to meet you. I think it was the third time I met you. So. Oh, okay, sorry. You know, I'm 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 happy, I'm happy to manage I, the group. I, I think I think I was I was roasted in the final banquet by uh, by a comedian, uh, and uh, one of the things he mentioned yeah, was lot. my lack of memory funny. and my lack of ability to remember anybody. So uh, I apologize to everybody who I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're out there meeting thousands of people doing doing our work for us. Yep, so I appreciate that. We appreciate it. Yep. So I had a question about um, central purpose, and you you basically just summarized it where it's it's your um, central concern, and then you it establishes a hierarchy or relative importance of all your other values. And if it's if it's your career, and you make that your central purpose, I have dif- difficulty understanding how like like values like a family or improving the political culture can integrate with a central purpose that's my career so i want to create great things as a mechanical engineer but i also want to fall in love and raise kids which would be amazing and help improve the culture towards this reason and capitalism which would be great so how, how do those actually fill in and integrate with being a great mechanical engineer good question <laughs> I get that. I asked for a challenging question. I got one. Um, so let's, I think the easier one is, is to talk about po- political change and, and the fact that we want political change. I mean, one can't separate the fact that a big reason for wanting political change is to be able to pursue one central purpose more effectively in a freer environment, to benefit more from, from one's career, to make more money, to, to be freer, to expand and go in directions one couldn't even imagine uh, going in. So I think actually the political one is easy uh, to relate. And, and, but in, and indeed, it's not a key feature of your career as a mechanical engineer. So you're going to spend some time on it, but not a lot of time on it. You're going to spend more time pursuing more knowledge around mechanical engineering and pursuing opportunities to improve your job prospects and the kind of challenges you face and the kind of career you're going to have than you would otherwise. So I think in the hierarchy, political change is there, but it's not very high. And that's why, indeed, you devote less time and less money to political change than you should devote to actually pursuing a, you know, a, a meaningful career and a meaningful activity. On the other hand, if things get really bad, then you realize that your career is lost. You won't be able to have a career if, if you know, the fascists take over America. So... As things get worse, the value of fighting for a better world increases. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Now, especially as you see um, government control really uh, take over industries. They could outlaw the entire uh, petroleum engineering field. Yep. <laughs> yep. They, they'll, they'll, they're going to. Sl- they're slowing down. Um, uh, medical device innovations and everything. In everything. Yeah, it, government, it, 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 government is destroying yeah. field after field after field. So that one, that integration is relatively easy. So let's do family because that's a little harder. So, so if the central purpose of, is, is um, the fe- central purpose in life is one's career, then why pursue a romantic relationship and why even consider raising children who are, who are incredibly time consuming and, and, uh, and demand a lot from, from a human being. It's not easy to raise, to raise children. Um, and I'd say because it's a central purpose, which doesn't mean it's an only purpose. And, and one, in order to achieve one's central purpose, one has to recognize one's needs as a human being. And the fact is that not all one's needs as a human being are satisfied by productive work. Some needs as one, and and if one ignores those other needs, other needs that are not central, but are still real needs, the requirements of human survival, the requirements of human flourishing, requirements of of being a success as a human being, if one ignores those needs, ultimately, one's ability to pursue one central purpose will be damaged. So, for example... You know, I, I believe sex is, is, a, is a real need, not in the sense that you have to have sex and, you know, go use prostitutes if nothing else ha- happens because you just have to have that, you know, you have to ejaculate, ejaculate or some, something like that. But sex is a need in terms of a spiritual need that whatever it is that we get from sex, that spiritual 
an, an emotional um, recharging, joy, happiness that we get from that is so valuable and gives us so much pleasure that it enhances our ability to be productive and be successful in other areas of our life. Having somebody you love at home makes it so much easier to leave and produce and create and, and, and when you get home exhausted, be able to then, you know, relate to somebody who understands what you're going through and supports you and allows you to get up the next morning and go do it again, right? Think about how damaging Lillian is to, to read it, to his life. Yeah, so he ignores her, right, in the fountainhead. He ignores her. And not in the fountainhead. What am I saying? In Atlas Shrugged. But it's damaging to him. It, it chips away at him. It reduces his motivation. It makes it, everything harder for him. Right? Imagine if he had a loving wife at home. Reardon, imagine how successful Reardon could have been if he was completely, utterly motivated. And, 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 and even if he'd spent, he would have spent less time at work. Right? Which he would have. He would have spent less time at work. Because part of it, he's spending time at work to escape having to face his family. But imagine if he spent less time at work, but he'd be so much more productive when he was at work because he wouldn't be torn about his family and about the guilt and about the, 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 you know, the horrible situation he gets when he gets at home. Right? So family, particularly having a romantic relationship in particular, is integral to having a, a career. It's so important to having a successful career. And without it, it's very difficult, I think, to actually achieve a successful career, particularly romantic love. Family is more difficult. And that's why, you know, you have to be committed to having a family. You have to understand the values you're going to get from having kids and, and, and have that as part and parcel of what it means to be, you know, have that as, as a real value and a real need for you that is fulfilled and, and integrate that with your career and, and your purpose in life. So does that, is that satisfactory? an answer i think so it also reminds me a bit of ayn rand's point about the purpose of art how you're, yes. you're out there achieving and then every once in a while you need you need to pause and get reminded of the big picture and br br bring your abstract principles up down to the perceptual level absolutely or, or with your romantic it, or with your romantic partner, just get the psychological visibility, them reminding you that, yeah, you're doing a good job. You, you, you're an awesome person. And that's, I think, required for self-esteem, which is then self-esteem is very helpful for, uh, for, um, for productiveness. And, but but think, about, think about arts as primarily dealing with the metaphysical value judgments and metaphysics, really, really big concepts, big ideas, and, and, and relationships, friendships, family, a, a romantic partner, sex is all dealing with, um, you know, with, with led metaphysical, more moral, more, you know, values. So yes, it's all in the same kind of pattern. We're not one dimensional beings. It's not about life. It's not just about applying our reason to our central purpose. There's other things that lead that make it possible for us. We're, we're, we're complex psychological beings that require art and sex and family. Some people, if it's a good family, right? Friendship. Let's, let's unify all those under love. They require love in order to sustain the energy over a lifetime to pursue our central purpose. That's not a bad formulation. So all of those things are part of that. Part of that sustained energy, part of providing the fuel that makes that possible. The central purpose is so central. Everything else integrates, but, but you can't have, so you can't have things that contradict with the central purpose. And, and, and sometimes you do. A child gets sick. You have to give up a career for a while to take care of a child. But it's always about getting back to that, right? So, because, you know, you have responsibilities once you have a child. You can't just ignore them, even if it's uh, diverting you from your central purpose. But, one of the beauties of objectivism is that everything is integrated. I mean, um, Ayn Rand used to play, they used to play this game in the collective days where concepts in a hat and you used to pull out two concepts uh, and then you'd have to find, show how they were integrated. Show how they were integrated. Um, so um, anyway, now, so, all right. So th does that make sense? 
Yeah, I think it was a, a thorough answer. Good. Thanks very much. Good. Sure. Thank you. All right. We're, we're about out of, uh, out of time. I mean, the show, I'm going to try to do an hour and a half. I don't want to do it two hours. That's a little long. Um, but um, this is the new format. Uh, hopefully, we'll have an opportunity to delve into more philosophical questions. They won't always be uh, philosophical, but uh, hopefully what we talked about today uh, increased your understanding of the virtual productiveness and, and what it really means and, and how to apply it. There's still a lot to talk about. Uh, there's still a lot to talk about, and uh, there's still a lot to talk about about productiveness. And, uh, uh, you know, somebody on the chat has brought up some answers that Dr. Peacock has answered that relate to some of these things. So it would be it would be if uh, Dr. Peacock, uh, Leonard Peacock agrees with me on all this stuff. I, I think he does. Most of it comes out of uh, OPA. All right. So um, read OPA. Um, Market this show. Market other shows. We've got a lot going on under the banner of the Iran Book Show. We want to make this a, a, a major, big, you know, podcasting, YouTubing, Facebook living empire. Uh, there should be hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, listeners and followers and so on. Not sure what the topic is next week. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to give you a few days' notice before, before each show and give you, uh, give you the topic. If you have ideas, keep sending them, airiradio.com. I did not get to, um, to Ethan's question, but I will get to it. It's a good question. Um, and, and maybe we'll show, do a show about altruism, and we'll talk about that question as well because it, it relates altruism to production. Um, and um, we'll talk next week sometime. It won't be exactly on a Monday, as I said at the beginning of the show. I'll, I'll give you plenty of notice, uh, but it'll be sometime Sometime later in the week, on Monday next week, I will be. Um, I rest in peace. My question? No, I'm not. I'm. You know, I will get to it. I promise. I promise. Right. I just don't want to go for two hours today, so I'm gonna have to give it uh, give it a call. So let's talk next time about altruism and productiveness, which is the heart of uh, the heart of Ethan's question: altruism and productiveness, uh, and. Um, and we'll talk about other aspects of altruism as well. So, uh, Angela, if you're there, altruism and productiveness we're going to do next week. Uh, so we answer Ethan's question uh, because he's, he's getting impatient with me, right? All right. It was, uh, it was fun talking to you guys. Um, think about participating more. Think about getting more people on live, both on Facebook and here. Think about asking short questions so I can absorb them quickly on Facebook Live and other places. And calling in, and you know, let's let's make this the place all objectivists have to do on a Monday afternoon. All right, on a Monday evening for most of you. All right, thanks for listening. Talk to you soon. Uh, you've been listening to the Iran Book Show, Living Objectivism.